I have Chris Lane with me here today, and we he is a board member on PAA. Chris, how long have you been a, a board member with us? I'm completing my second year. Uh, this this actually this October would be my second year. Wonderful. Well, uh, if you could, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Absolutely, uh, Leah. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, my background is is a lot like many others, but uh, unique in its own way. So, born in 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 Iowa, raised until the fifth grade in Iowa, moved to Southern Ohio. Um, never knew my biological father. So uh, when we moved to Ohio, it was because my mom uh, got married and, and my now dad adopted me. Great experience uh, for a youngster. Uh, moved to Southern Ohio. He was a CFO for hospitals. So we moved around a bit. So I lived for a couple of years in Southern Ohio, lived in a different suburb of Southern Ohio, landed in Ashland, Ohio uh, for a couple of years. And while I landed there, my mom and my now father got divorced. So. Um, you know, I've, I've had an interesting family dynamic my, my entire life. Part of that um, then, you know, I think, led me to who I am today. So um, graduated high school in Ashland, went to Hiram College, played soccer and rugby there, had a great college experience, but um, forgot to grow up in the process. Right? So yeah. got accepted to law school, decided law school wasn't a good idea at the time. <laughs> so I stayed on campus and um, coached soccer and ran a small hotel. Wow. Um, and then I found myself needing to go to the army, that whole grow up process. Right. Yeah. So, um, that lasted for about two and a half years. It was a great experience. Love coaching. Uh, that was my first real experience in the hospitality world. Mm -hmm. Um, then I left for the army and I, I really, you know, I was older. So, you know, when you enter the army, a lot of times it's, you're straight out of high school. You're still, even though you're an adult, you're immature, you don't have a lot of life experience. Well, I found myself as like the old guy, right? I'm, I'm 20, almost 23, got a college degree. I'm in basic training around and like, what is going on here? You know, it was physically hard, but it was the mental games that, you know, okay, I, I think I had an advantage and I think that helped me be successful, but had a great, yeah. great basic training experience, um, really catapulted me on to uh, what I think to be a, a pretty successful career. So spent seven years in the army. Uh, the last three, I was a drill sergeant. Um, you know, we were part of a group of of guys that were yanked out of Operation Iraqi Freedoms one through three. Mm -hmm. And as we realized we were fighting the war like we were in Vietnam and that wasn't working, they needed mm -hmm. some folks who'd, who'd had some combat experience over there to come help rewrite the POI. Uh, how are we going to train folks to uh, go fight a different kind of war in a different way? So um, we went through a crash course, gave them a lot of feedback, came up with a new process that's still in place today. There's been some modifications, but I'm pretty proud of the fact that we were able to, um, in a very short order, use our experiences to change the way that we train and develop soldiers uh, for the future. Um, had my son about a year and a half before I got out, and as I was coming off of drill sergeant duty, my next duty station was going to be Okinawa, Japan. And for us army guys, mm -hmm. it's, that's kind of an odd duty station, right? Okay. More, more Marines go there. There's not a whole lot over there. And if you do happen to go there, usually it's unaccompanied. So I wasn't going to be able to take my family. Well, I had an interesting, mm -hmm. interesting experience because mine was going to be accompanied. I got to take my family, my wife and my brand new kid, <laughs> except my wife did not have the same burning desire to raise <laughs> our kid in a foreign country. So um, that was the end of my career. I wasn't wasn't willing to go over there and, and separate myself. Um, yeah. So um, got out and came back to Dover, Ohio, where we are today. And, um, you know, we're second generation Wendy's franchisees. So we've got eight restaurants. We've been sole owners for the last almost seven years now. And, um, you know, I started off as a manager of training. I had no idea if this was going to work. I didn't know if this is what I wanted to do. I just spent seven years in the army, right? Lots of structure, right. lots of regiment, lots of routine. Um, and here we go. Uh, let's go run restaurants. Uh, <laughs> love it. Great. Um, great experience. Worked myself all the way from assistant manager, all the way up to district manager, and now uh, as owner operator. That's amazing. So that's a, that's, that's a, that's a 10,000 foot view with about 5,000 <laughs> feet of details. I love it. I love it. Uh, what, 
coming out of the army, or maybe it was even while you were in the army, what got you involved in prevention? What, what was that kind of stepping stone or that thought process, your desire for, for that? That's a great question. You know, even while I was in the army, I stayed active in other things, right? So I became an equal opportunity advisor. I was the um, your analysis. So I, I took an interest in all the other things that go into making the total soldier. Mm-hmm. And that's really no different than what it takes to make the total human out in the civilian world. So, you know, as I integrated into our new community, I was new here, just kind of figuring things out. We, we have a school program here that's introduced in fourth grade uh, that's called taking it to the schools. And it goes all the way through middle school. And that was my first exposure to um, organized facilitated prevention education, right? It's, it's okay. facilitated by Ohio Guidestone. You've probably heard of Jody Salvo, um, absolute rock star. Well, <laughs> she taught me hook, hook, line, and sinker, right? So, okay. Um, part of um, th- this program was they they have a graduation, right, where they they give out some awards, they give out some certificates and stuff, and they invite parents for you to come here and see what your child has been exposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, loved what I heard, loved what I saw and told Jody if there was ever anything I could do to reach out. Well, lesson learned, <laughs> never offer your services to a preventionist. <laughs> we will take it. <laughs> no, but seriously, that that's really kind of how I got started. Okay. And then, um, so I started integrating more and more with our local, um, uh, for, for lack of a better word, it's, it's um, Empower Tusk now, but it's the anti-drug coalition. It's the, you know, the coalition that's here of the the different sectors of the community led by the preventionist as to how we can make our communities better. Mm-hmm. And uh, I became the business sector sector representative for our coalition and just started thinking about how as an employer mm-hmm. can I influence at the earliest level better employees through processes, mm-hmm. through education, through opportunities. And if we do happen to get off the, the beaten path of prevention, how do I also then provide resource to treatment uh, Mm -hmm. in recovery right so um you know just just that and then i you know like like i said i i love to talk you get me started (laughs) and i'm comfortable talking in front of people so um they will utilize me for some public speaking things they'll utilize Mm -hmm. me for going and soliciting some um funding support and Mm -hmm. uh in the last two three years now um they they've actually utilized me and this is probably my favorite part because i was a political science major in college oh okay is is um when when they need a non-prevention voice for testimony Mm -hmm. yeah um, in support of in opposition of or for educational purposes for pending legislation um so i was able to speak during COVID on the alcohol um Mm -hmm. rules expansion And I was recently able to testify um, in opposition for the expansion of the medical marijuana program. And I I think I come at it from a slightly different view where I take some of the legislators by surprise Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, they they listen. So that's kind of how I got involved and still love doing all that stuff today. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for, for all your advocacy and all your work. Um, turning a little bit into the, you know, the veteran side, the army side, what are some of the risks that you see veterans are facing? Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, can we have a whole separate hour? Right. Um, and, and it's, and it's not just veterans, but you know, we, we have to look at it from a, a, a total experience perspective. Okay. And veterans are trained, you know, we're, we enlist voluntarily or serve voluntarily. And part of that service is changing our entire being, right? They break us down mm-hmm. to build us up and create this, this warrior, if you will, who, who's solely focused on accomplishing the mission at all costs. Mm-hmm. And at every service member's career ends someday. Right. By choice um, or not, it ends someday. And depending on your length of service, depending on your exposure before then, the world you enter is not the world you left. Mm-hmm. At all. Mm-hmm. And the, the biggest things that we have is, you know, 
one, dealing with stress, the tools, the mechanisms, the time, um, the outlets that you have as a service member to deal with stress are very different than what you have as a civilian, right? You mm -hmm. take for granted as a, a veteran to some degree, I just, I have this medical system at my resource. I don't have to pay for it. I don't, I just go. Well, especially out here now, now I've got to go either whether I'm taking advantage of the VA system or the, the mm -hmm. private uh, healthcare system, I've got to wait in line. I've got to pay for it. I might mm -hmm. not like who I get. Um, you know, so, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is um, the perception that we are rigid and, and um, killers or, mm -hmm. um, you know, mission at all costs, all those things really changes the way that, that people approach us. And you can always find somebody who's, who's been around veterans for a while because the first question they don't ask you is, did you ever kill somebody? Right. You, that's, mm. just, that's just a no, no. But mm. you, know, you, you get into a group of people who aren't usually around veterans and that's all they really want to know. Yeah. Um, so the, the perception problem, you know, you go to try to get an em employment or even if you get employment or you serve on something, the second people view you or see you as a veteran, they expect something different. Right. You're going to be vocal. You're going to be brash. You're probably going to be um, directive and, and telling people what to do, barking orders, what, whatever those things are. Uh, and the last one is very recently this this battle of loneliness, right? Um, and unless you've managed to stick around a, a, re a retirement base or somewhere where there are large pods of congregated veterans, you're alone. Mm -hmm. um, because when you get to your new community, the last thing you want to do is go find a veterans group really to go be part of. It's a great opportunity, but a lot of folks are so focused on, I got to take care of my family. I got to go get a job. I got to do all these other things. I don't spend the time to go get linked up with the VFW or the American Legion or veteran services that, that provides programs, things like that. So you, you feel lonely and you feel a little bit lost. And now we've, we've instituted this remote treatment possibility. And I think that in and of itself is the biggest danger, Leah, that I mm -hmm. see. I know it's very convenient, but here's what I also know. God created us to be in connection with each other and that doesn't happen remotely. Yeah. And if the only time I see a doctor is remote and that's who's prescribing me pills, you're not going to recognize the danger signs that mm -hmm. I'm addicted or that I'm abusing or that I'm, you know, you don't get that perspective online mm -hmm. and um, the fact that we're mailing pills to veterans who can walk around the corner and buy alcohol until four o'clock in the morning is a mm -hmm. recipe for disaster. Yeah, absolutely. So what, given some of those, um, I guess kind of what you said, like recipes for disaster, what are, what would you recommend to your fellow veterans on how, how sim I guess, simply how to prevent you walking down that path? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. There are a couple of things that I would suggest, Leah, you know, very, very first thing is no matter how alone you feel, you're not alone and you've, you've got to get connected to somebody whether that's a veterans group, a religious organization, a, uh, you know, Kiwanis, it doesn't matter. You've got to get connected to another group of people. You can't fight these battles. You can't fight these challenges alone. And we weren't built to. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is uh, don't be afraid to admit you have a problem. Mm -hmm. That may not be a substance abuse problem. That may be a, I'm having a hard time coping problem. That may be, mm -hmm. I don't fit in problem. That may be a, I can't hold a job because I'm not doing a great job of managing my interaction with others. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what it is. We all have challenges and problems and it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then find the people that you can surround yourself with that want to help you overcome those, not make them worse. Right. If mm -hmm. the only thing your interaction with folks is to do is to sit around and drink beer and tell stories. Um, that's not going to help you overcome these challenges. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's good and that's healthy. I, I, I do it myself, but if that's the only interaction we have with other people, it's not going to be helpful. I've mm -hmm. got to go serve others. I've got to go help others. And I've got to be working on myself as a human 
to make sure that I, I can still see the bigger picture because those, those narrow blinders come in real fast. And the only thing you can see is despair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really easy to, once you're in that despair, it's very difficult to take those blinders off. Um, It it is, I I say it and it, you know, I, I'm, you know, I don't have PTSD. I don't think I don't have some of the problems that others do. So I don't say this flippantly, Mm -hmm. but despair for a veteran is the shallowest hole with the biggest step ever imagined. Mm, I like that analogy. We can get out of this hole. It's not as difficult as we think it is, but the story we tell ourselves make it look like this unsurmountable first step, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's not steps two, three, and four that are killer. Mm -hmm. It's that first step of getting out of that shallow hole that is just so unimaginably large in our mind Mm -hmm. that it's, it's so hard. So when I get a chance, I always try to make that first step as small as I possibly can Mm -hmm. because steps two, three, and four really are difficult. They are. And they need trained professionals for help. and, and, And that's a good thing. But that first step is not as hard as we tell ourselves Mm -hmm. because it can be done with a friend, with a loved one, with a family member, with an advocate. Mm -hmm. You don't need a trained professional to take step number one. Yeah. So why do you think we make it so they make it or we make it so difficult? I think it's, you know, maybe not necessarily just pertaining to veterans. I think everybody really makes that that first step seem insurmountable. Why, why do you think that is? Um, that, that's a great question. Um, and, and I'll, I'll use another analogy uh, to try and help um, describe because I'm probably not going to be able to say it right the first time. Okay. Um, that first step looks like a cliff, not a slope. Mm. Walking up a slope might be difficult, but it's one step at a time and I can see the top. Mm-hmm. Walking up a cliff is a vertical trajectory that I may or may not convince myself I can take step number one even, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So what we've done is we've created this in or out, right or wrong, good or bad, healthy or unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've created this black and white world where we've taken away the slope of reality that nothing exists in absolute, right? It's it's a continuum. It's a blend. Every life is gray. Yeah, it's it's a blend. And we've 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 taken the slope out where I can live in the gray or live in the median. And it's I'm in or I'm out. I'm healthy mm-hmm. or I'm unhealthy. I'm savable or I'm unsavable. And I think that is what makes that first step so difficult is we've made it a cliff and not a slope. Yeah. One thing you mentioned was during that first step, there you can do it with a friend, you can do it with a family member, a loved one. What are People who are connected to veterans, how do you think is the best way they can go about supporting them? I know at one point you mentioned, you know, the first thing you don't ask is, did you kill somebody? And so what what are some do's and what are some don'ts for people who have uh, loved ones who are veterans? Yeah. Um, start with the don'ts, right? Look, don't, don't, ex- don't spend all your time focused on their service, right? That's the past. That's the, that's the source of some of their stress, their anger, mm-hmm. their other things. That's the source, right? So focus more on them as a human, not them as a veteran or a soldier. Okay. Right? Start with the human and add the other lenses as you gain credibility, as you gain trust, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then d- don't be afraid to push back a little, right? What do you mean with, by that? With, with respect and with love, you know, the, the question of how are you today? I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Are you really? Right? That's pushing back a little. That's pushing right. back with love. That's not accepting the answer I want you to hear. That's accepting the answer I need to hear, which is deeper than I'm fine, mm-hmm. right? So we have to be willing to probe a bit um, and that takes time. You can't just mm-hmm. push back on someone. You know, we, we think about this as a bank account when you, when you talk about emotional intelligence, right? Your, your deposits right. have to be greater than your withdrawals. <laughs> so you've got to pour into anybody, whether they're a veteran or not, you've got to pour in before you start taking out. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what a good counselor knows how to do is gain trust through um, listening, through mm-hmm. empathizing, through 
recognizing uh, the reality that is the story that's being told, and then connecting in a way that that overcomes the barriers, right? No veteran is ever going to take down all their barriers. They're just mm-hmm. not. We're not trained to do that. That's not comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, so finding out which ones can come down and mm-hmm. figuring out how to deal with the ones that stay up, right? Um, the, the second thing that I would always start with is the number one thing that that veterans, disabled or not, I don't care if you're in a wheelchair. I don't care if you've got a prosthetic. Unless you're absolutely bedridden, physical exercise of some kind will change the conversation. You know, there's a great um, veterans organization out there called Team Red, White, and Blue. It's built around social interaction, physical activity, and sometimes it's bowling and yoga. It's not just going out running half mm-hmm. marathons. Not everybody can do that, right? <laughs> right. But But going on a walk and listening mm-hmm. to the story, that's physical activity. That mm-hmm. changes the endorphins, that changes the mobility, that changes the way that we're living. And we start to live a, a holistically healthy life. Now I can start to challenge and, and, and feel like I can battle those demons that I may be wrestling. So start with physical activity of any kind, whether it's a game, whether you got, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be necessarily exercise, right? Shooting guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's shooting bows and arrows. Maybe it's um, painting. It, Physical activity is the act of doing something, not the act of sweating when I say physical activity. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. From So those are great, great ideas, great do's and don'ts for kind of the friends and family connections. As an employer, how do you, I guess, one kind of recognize some of the signs of um, somebody who you know, it's maybe facing some of those risks mm-hmm. or also how do you, uh, just going back to prevention, what are some of the things you put in place to help guide them on, on that journey? Yeah, that, that's another great question. And, you know, a, as an employer who I think I feel more well-equipped than most to deal with <laughs> some of the veterans things, because I, I can mm-hmm. have exposure to it for a completely inexperienced, um, employer who has a, a population of veterans as employees, the, the first thing I would tell you is your HR person isn't enough. They're trained okay. in dealing with people, but they're not trained in dealing with veterans necessarily, right? So seek a veteran-specific resource, whether that be your local veteran services, whether that be um, the VFW, or find other folks who can help advise you and create specific programs that recognize the differences uh, and provide outlets and resources to uh, them, just like you would any other, um, and I'll use this loosely, but protected class in your organization, mm-hmm. right? Veterans are are a protected class uh, legally, but we don't often think about the non-legal way of protecting our employees and pods, right? Giving right. them a safe world to exist in has nothing to do with the legality of hiring them, terminating them, and continuing their employment. Mm-hmm. It's, it's what we do as employers to create an environment where people feel valued people feel respected and that their previous experiences are um, something that we want to leverage, not hold against you uh, Mm -hmm. as as you move on. So, you know, thinking about ways to celebrate that. And one of the easiest ways to do is, is put them in charge. Mm. If, If you, if you could do anything to help us better deal with veterans issues in our workplace, what would it be? Right. Just okay. put them in charge. They've got ideas. Yeah. And if they don't, ask them if they'd like to be part of a solution. Oh my gosh, now now we've stepped well beyond step one. We're right. down to step two. I've gotten <laughs> them to commit to a program of treatment maybe, and they don't even know it. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. so, so it's sometimes it's thinking outside the box of, man, they're struggling. I don't know how to deal with them. Put them in charge. Don't yeah. turn them loose but put them in charge of something where they can build success, start to gain momentum. And the next thing you know, it, you, you may have the the next uh, best program in your company that, that doesn't have to be exclusive to veterans. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Do you think that, especially like with putting them in charge, do you think that that kind of, provides them that 
almost that connection back to when they were in the army? Or do you think that that's just something that helps propel them forward in taking, helping to take care of their, their mental well-being? Um, that, that's, that's a tough one, Leah, because not everybody's experience in the army put them in charge. Oh, okay. That's fair. Right. Um, right. Everybody's experience is a little bit different. Some people may be more comfortable not being in charge. Mm-hmm. Just taking orders, just do, you know, the, the old, just do what you're told. Stop thinking. Right. Right. That, that they may have been broken down and their experience never got them to a place to where they were able to overcome that mentality mm-hmm. and be in charge of other people and be the person who was doing the thinking, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, so you really have to do some investigating and to determine what their capacity is. Mm-hmm. It, it is absolutely from somebody who's being used to being in charge. It is a way to accelerate that very quickly. But mm-hmm. it can also be dangerous, right? Because being in charge in the civilian world is very different than being in charge in the military world. <laughs> that is true. I can take your time. I can go, you know, that's very different than out here. Right? Mm-hmm. Drop and do 20. No, that's not how we be in charge here. So right. You still have to manage it either way. But what it does is it provides them a sense of belonging to something bigger. And okay. that really is something every service member has ingrained in them, right? Mm-hmm. You can see it in a room of veterans. You've got the Marines over there. They congregate with each other. You got the army guys. They could, and the next thing you know, they're talking about eating crayons and flying ships and (laughs) all the other things, because that's what we're used to. And it's that sense of belonging that, so if I feel like I'm in charge of something, I feel like I belong to it Mm -hmm. and I have something invested in it and I've given something to it. So my, my um, commitment to making it work is going to be a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Having that, having that camaraderie um yeah among among the, the other employees among other veterans that they could be assisting and things like that absolutely so um as we wrap up is there anything else that kind of comes to mind as as we're approaching veterans day um that we can just be mindful of as we are going out into society and interacting with veterans or you are a veteran and um, that day is coming up. So is there anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, this, this is a tough one for me, Leah, because it's, it's something that drives me a little crazy about the culture that we've created now. Um, veterans day is every day. So is national Hispanic day and, mm-hmm. and right Yep. The more we focus on this for one day, the less likely we, we are to actually solve the problem. I love so that. If if I could ask anything of my fellow veterans, of other people, it's don't do it in a day. Make it every day, right? It, now, I don't have to intentionally go out and buy a veteran his meal every day. Mm-hmm. But why does it hurt to say thank you? Or right. why does it hurt to just recognize your neighbor that you know instead of just on Veterans Day once a month or something? You know, we mm-hmm. the, the mentality that it's it's one day and that's enough is is part of that slope that we've mm-hmm. taken away. It's now just an event, and when it's over, they're in despair and loneliness again. Right. Yeah. Sorry. No, don't be sorry. And and I think that's a huge thing to to recognize this is not just one day, like this is, this is life and this is, this is every day. And, um, and, and you kind of, you beat me to the punch a little bit. I was, uh, gonna say, you know, just thank you so much for your service and any veterans who are listening, thank you for your service. You, um, you deserve our thanks. And, um, but I completely agree. It's every day. It, uh, and the more we just focus on it being one day, um, there, there's a whole year where, where they're struggling. So, um, I echo your words wholeheartedly. Yeah. And, and, and it, you know, this is about veterans day and, you know, absolutely. Thank you to all those. And, and our experiences coming out of service are all very different, right? What I experienced Mm -hmm. coming out of operation Iraqi freedom is very different than what Vietnam War vets and, and World War II vets. And, and every one of those experiences are real, they're significant, and they matter. Mm-hmm. 
And um, the, the more we can treat every day like every group matters, mm-hmm. the better off we're going to be. And what, what better way to do it than pick a day of people who volunteer to serve at all costs mm-hmm. to just dedicate to say, you know what, this next year, I'm going to make a commitment to serve others, mm-hmm. not just veterans, um, whether that be in word, in deed, in time, but just make a commitment to serve others and, and make that your marching cry for the next year. You, you, would, mm-hmm. you will change the world. Yeah, I love it. Well, let's change the world, people. And thank you again, Chris. I value the insight you were able to give us. Again, thank you so much for your service and thank you for all of your work in prevention and advocacy that you're doing. Um, it makes an impact. It makes a difference. So thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Leah. It's it's a pleasure to continue to serve outside of my years of service and you find something else bigger and, and, and dedicate yourself to it. All right. Well, I hope you have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks.